Hi. Hi. So, Nikesh, um, we were sitting backstage chatting, and I asked you to write a note, uh, which I then sent to my assistant, who is this remarkably hardworking, incredibly smart, 20-something South Asian woman. And <clears throat> within about three seconds, uh, I texted it to her, and by three seconds it came back, and based on the reactions, the emojis, and the capitalized letters, it was as if she had received a note from the Pope of Wakanda. Um, and so I'm wondering... I don't think Wakanda's religious structures work in that way, but... <laughs> You're going to educate us today, I can tell. So why did, why did, that prov why did you, you get that rock star reaction from my assistant? <laughs> I have no idea. Um, Who are you? Um, so, uh, I'm Nick Esch, I'm an author, uh, I, in 2016 I edited the collection The Good Immigrant, and this year The Good Immigrant USA, and I guess in publishing circles I'm known as a diversity activist. Uh, would you rather be an author or a diversity activist? Yeah, like, I, 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 I was born to tell stories, like, that's what I'm good at, um, you know, writing is where I feel my most comfortable. Um, that given what I'm actually asking for in publishing, which is to have like, better representation for people from marginalized communities, I don't think I'm asking for anything that revolutionary or special. I feel like everyone could be asking for those things, and so uh, I would much rather that um, we all push for better, better representation and um, proper activists who do amazing activist work get that label rather than people like me. So you specialize in telling stories that are undiscovered and un untold, and you have a, a family story that's, that's undiscovered and untold. Tell us about it. Yeah, it's, it's a story in my family that I draw a lot of strength from, and it's pro probably the reason why I feel like I'm a fighter and one person can make a difference. Like, in 1968, my uncle uh, tried to buy a house in Huddersfield, and he became the first person to ever bring a case of racial discrimination under the 1968 Race Relations Act. Um, so he tried to buy a house and the, the people selling the house refused to sell it to him. They said they had a company policy not to sell to colored people, excuse me for using a slur. Um, and instead of just be quiet and go away, my uncle decided to use this newly instituted act um, to take them to court. And he did it at a huge, great personal cost to himself. Like his friends and his family were like, don't do this, don't make a fuss, um, keep, don't stick your head above the parapet, just work hard. That kind of age old immigrant motto, just work hard, um, keep doing what you're doing. Um, his work didn't want him to bring this case, but he believed that this law had been brought into place to protect people like him in instances like this, and he wanted to use the law. So he did it. And how did it turn out? <laughs> I that, mean, thanks for your applause, but, but um, the, the, the <laughs> ending's not that great. <laughs> um, so uh, the the case, like, because so, it was a new bit of legislation, there were uh, there was a technicality that meant that the judge had to reserve their judgment, and in their dismissal of the case, um, they did say that had they tried it, they would have found in favour of my uncle because discrimination had taken place. And off the back of that, the company did change their policy. Um, but, you know, the message still stands that he felt like the law should be used in that way. So that's 1968. Yeah. Um, fast forward 50 years ahead, um, you and your uncle are having a conversation. Tell us what you think has improved, changed, or not improved and, and changed since. So yeah, my uncle and I chat quite a lot, especially since The Good Immigrant came out, because obviously it kick-started a big conversation around race and immigration issues. It was a conversation starter for a lot of people. And I think my uncle was very proud of what I did with the book, but he also felt very sanguine about, um, he felt like things had gone backwards. Like um, this tussle that we had was, I was always like, I don't think racism has got worse. I just feel like it is now, it feels emboldened to step out from the shadows. Whereas my uncle was like, no, it feels like it's got worse. And we were talking about this uh, case in 2017 where this landlord uh, was being taken to court because they refused to rent properties out to South Asians in Kent uh, because they, um, according to this landlord, they stank the place out with their curry smell, which we all know is ridiculous because curry smells delicious, right? <laughs> um, 
And my uncle and I were talking about it, and I was saying, like, yeah, it just reminds me of the shame that we felt growing up and, like, how, you know, my mum carried the burden of that, like, oh, smelly, smelly... Oh, well, I've already used one slur. Why not use another? Smelly, packy thing. And, um, my, uh, and you know, to the, po to the result where, like, as soon as we got home from school, me and my sisters, we had to change out of our school uniforms into our house clothes because she was like, don't wear your school uniforms in the house. Your clothes will stink of curry the kids at school, don't give them ammunition. And I said that, I said that to him, and he said, yeah, you, you say that, but also it, it's, it's bigger than that. Um, he said, like, I fought this exact same case 50 years ago. 50 years ago, they put a law in place that was supposed to make us equal. It's been 50 years, and what has changed? Sure, there are laws in place to make us all equal, but what has been done to change people's hearts and minds um, to make sure that they don't think things like this? Like, what is the work that's being done there? And that made me feel really sad that my uncle in 50 years felt like things hadn't changed. They'd got worse. So you're in the business, you're, you're, a, you're a writer, you've achieved considerable acclaim, and you're in the business of trying to change people's hearts and minds. So give us a little bit of a, uh, a how-to. How, how, do, how does one go about doing that? Well, I think, I think it, it's... So I, I believe that storytellers... Um, are people who can, who, who can act as like agents of empathy and a, a, agents of reflection as well. I think, I think representation and inclusion in um, the books we read and the films and TV that we watch at, at formative stages of our lives can have um, an active role in our aspiration levels. So like, you know, if we, if we see ourselves as the main character in stories, whether those stories are, I went to the shops with my dad and, and bought uh, some bread, or I saved the world from this huge meteorite, like the main, if the main characters of those stories um, are diverse, then you, you look at them and you, you see yourself in that role. You see yourself as someone who does something as mundane as go to the shops, or as the superhero saving the world from a meteorite. And, um, and, and you know, there's this quote by, by a writer where he said that, um, Vampires have no reflection in, in fiction, like monsters have no reflection, and if you want to turn a human being into a monster, then deny them at the cultural level any reflection of themselves. And I thought about that quite a lot, because I think, I think a lot about uh, the moment I saw myself for the first time. Um, it was 1994, I was watching TV, and an advert came on for this new BBC Two series called The Buddha of Suburbia, starring a young Naveen Andrews, really beautiful, long, curly hair. I'd never seen an Asian kid on TV before, other than, like, Bollywood, like, but not, like, a British Asian kid. And there he was, like, in a, in a suburb of London that looked like the one that I grew up in, like, chasing girls, doing drugs, listening to Bowie, and I was like, this kid is me. I mean, minus the any of those things. I hated Bowie. <laughs> I didn't really. I didn't really. Um, but, there, uh, but it looked like the kind of show that I didn't want to really sit next to my parents and watch. Um, and no one knew how to use uh, the timer on a video recorder in the, in the 90s. I was a one TV household. But then it said, based on the novel, Bud of Suburbia, Suburbia by Hanif Qureshi. And I was like, aha, a loophole. I can get this out from the library. And so I went to the library and I got the book out and there were brown people on the cover and a, like a brown person standing. I was like, this is insane. I've never seen something like this before. And I read the first few lines in the library and I really remember that moment. It, it, the first few lines are, my name is Kareem Amir and I'm an Englishman through and through, almost. And that one word almost changed my life because finally I saw myself on the page. Like I grew up in a predominantly Gujarati community, speaking Gujarati at home, feeling like a little bit of an outsider. And then I'd go to school, which was predominantly white, and I wasn't white enough to hang out with the white kids and I wasn't brown enough to hang out with my community. I was somewhere in between. I was an almost. And I felt like a monster all these years. Um, you know, I felt like an outsider. I felt like I didn't belong. I felt like a stranger. I felt like a weirdo in whatever space I was in. And then suddenly, there he was, Kareem Amir, me. And that book acted as, as an amazing mirror, and I, it was so powerful. So culture can be an enabler of change and, and, can in, and, and help people portray things in different ways. You were telling me a story about Ghostbusters and how <laughs> that influenced your life. Tell me about that. Well, I mean, so, so I, I don't think, like, be, be amazing representation, it just works for people like me or, like, my, my kids or... 
um, like people who are from the margins. I, I don't think we're the only ones who benefit from seeing reflections of ourselves. It's, it's people who are in the majority as well. They get to see us as the main characters and not just the terrorist or the tech support. Um, and, and I think a lot about Ghostbusters. And like, so, I mean, I, I imagine a lot of you have seen Ghostbusters. It's probably a fair contingent of you. That's like your top five favorite films of all time. And, um, and then in 2015, they remade Ghostbusters and they recast it with four women. And oh my God, the men of the internet were furious, furious, four women, busting ghosts, imagine. They were so angry that they trolled, uh, you know, interesting, well, not interestingly, like they, they hounded uh, the only black member of the cast, Leslie Jones, off Twitter because they were so aggrieved that she was a Ghostbuster. And I just thought, these are the people who need diversity because they could suspend their disbelief enough for a world where ghosts need busting, but they refuse to suspend their disbelief enough for the thought that four women can do it. So t you started a prize. Tell us about it. Yeah, so I mean, when you do a lot of inclusion and diversity work, the thing that you find is like, you're, you're, you're seen as a complainer or a whiner. You're just like, you're always pushing back. And it can feel quite negative because people think that you're quite negative. And so um, my, friend, my dear friend Sunny Singh, the writer, and I decided we wanted to do something that celebrated all these amazing writers of color who are being uh, published. And so we, alongside uh, the Authors Club and Media Diversified, set up the Jullock Prize. Uh, for the best book by a British writer of colour as an act of celebration. And uh, the first year that we did it, um, an MP complained to the Equalities and Human Rights Commission about us and said that what we were doing was, um, was discriminatory because it discriminated against white writers. I mean, we were talking about honouring the best of like 60 odd books out of a possible 100 odd thousand, but he felt that um, we were being discriminatory and we basically had to um, brief a lawyer to help us fight this and um, we came up with uh, we basically had to come up with all this evidence to prove why the prize should exist and um, th the, th the thing that it felt like was you know we'd spent all this time convincing publishers and the media and writers and uh, readers and all the rest of it but now we had to start again and convince a government institution a, a statutory body the EHRC that of our right to exist. And it reminded me of that Toni Morrison quote that the function, the very function of racism is it, it's meant to distract you from doing the work that you're meant to be doing. I'm meant to be a writer. I'm meant to just be sitting here telling you about, doing the hard sell for you about why you should buy my books, but instead I'm talking about diversity work. And, and, and it's a distraction, it distracts you uh, because there'll always be one more thing and one more thing and one more thing. And so we, we put the, events together, we sent it off, and um, they said, okay, this counts as positive discrimination, and we may continue. And the prize is now in its third year, uh, which is amazing. But the interesting thing about that was, in the MP's letter, MP Philip Davis, let's name him, Freedom of Information, all that, um, <laughs> in his, yeah, boo, exactly. Um, <laughs> In his, he had also named The Guardian and HarperCollins, because they ran a similar prize. Um, Equality and Human Rights Commission never wrote to them. They just wrote to us, the two like writers doing a grassroots project voluntarily. And that, to me, set, told a tale about how power works in this country. So there's an incredible link between you and your uncle. Your uncle used the law to try and get him equal uh, access to housing. He lost, but the company changed the law. You set up a prize to promote diversity and inclusion. Uh, the law is used against you, uh, but they lose. And in both cases, upstanders and people fighting for a vision of equality who exemplified courage um, prevailed. Um, and I think that that's a remarkable success story that we should all be incredibly grateful for. Thanks. Thanks. I just want to say one thing before we, before we end. Like, 20 years ago, I was stood just over there watching Asian Dub Foundation on this stage, rock, raw festival hall, and I watched them, like a band of people who looked exactly like me, and I thought, one day I'm going to be on that stage. Uh, and, I, and I always thought... <laughs> but I, I, I always thought it would be um, as a world-famous rapper, but <laughs> it took the whole of my 20s to work out that I'm a very mediocre rapper, but a much be better writer. But the point is, I'm here, 
And if there are any young people of color out there watching on the live stream or in the audience tonight who are, like, who are looking at me going, one day I'm going to be on that stage. It took me 20 years. Hopefully it won't take you this long, but you'll get here. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you.